I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Industrial Community Development Committee. Um, members, uh, myself, Councilor Melville, Councilor McGinn, Councilor Gravel will sit in for Councilor McGinn, Councilor Rosignol, and Councilor Turco. We have a number of items on the agenda, and I'd like to call up uh, Community Development Director Kurt Bellavance to address each, each item, if you would, Mr. Bellavance. You have an, an agenda in front of you, same as us, correct? Yes, I do. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening. My name is Kurt Bellavance, uh, Community Development I'm Director. Sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Bellavance. I interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. The up, update regarding the sale of Crown and Shield Apartments is not on our agenda tonight. That is continued. No, that's in the Human Services Committee. That's in the Human Services Committee. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Bellavance. No, uh, thank you. Um, Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Gould. Uh, what I have before me is the agenda for the uh, Industrial and Community Development Committee, and listed under this different subjects are several items. Uh, the first one is a regard until the updates of the uh, Wigan Auditorium. So as you can see, if you look up to the, uh, up to the rafters there, you'll see we have uh, scaffolding up there. The project is, uh, is underway. Uh, the process took a little bit long to get somebody on board uh, because we did get a mass historical grant that we needed to get a uh, individual or co company that was required to meet their standards uh, for doing this type of work, this restoration work. So going through that process, identifying someone, getting someone fitting in with the schedule and so forth, it, it took a little bit longer than we thought. The mass historical had to approve the vendor and so forth, so we did finally get somebody on board. I'm going to say back in June and then trying to schedule that uh, individual to come in um, to do the work. So they're here. Uh, they expect to finish about the uh, beginning of October. Uh, and they've been, they understand we have meetings going on at different events and they've been working around, uh, around that and have been uh, diligently repairing uh, the ceiling and they'll be, they'll be here for several weeks now to get that work done. And they actually came uh, highly recommended from Mass Historical. I'd, if anybody has any questions on that. Councilor Gravel, please. <clears throat> yeah, I, <clears throat> I don't want to sound too sac sarcastic, but it uh, took a little bit longer. Is probably on the light side of, well, I guess today it would be called um, fake news. Uh, it was uh, roughly two years, maybe three years ago, the original uh, request was made um, under uh, Karen Sawyer's leadership. And uh, I know a year ago, Gravok flew a drone in here to get pictures of all of this so it could go out to bid. And um, we did a 360 camera view in here to make sure we saw the whole thing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see the scaffolding here, but the only thing that concerns me is what are we actually going to get done? Um, I hope it, my fear is, and my hope it, I'm, I'm hoping you're gonna tell me I'm wrong, is that they're gonna repair those bad spots and the rest of it gets left alone. When the goal in the first place was to bring back the greatness of this hall, and redo the interior using the money that was available from the excess that wasn't spent on the roof for the slate roofing, um, along with other monies that were put together, which did include the cultural money. The, the idea was supposed to be that we would do a restoration. So please tell me I'm wrong that they're not just gonna fix the places where the, where the plaster has come down and do a little patchwork here and there and call it a complete project because that would be very, very disappointing. Mr. Bellamans. Yep. Well, first, uh, uh, just let me apologize for the, uh, coming through the transition of having, taking over Karen's work, uh, working with Julie, Julie being uh, promoted to a different position, bringing uh, Debbie McGregor and myself. It just wasn't a project that was trying to get done right away. We knew we had a deadline to get done uh, in regards to the grant, uh, so that's why it, probably part of the delay on that as well, so apologize for that. Um, the second piece is I know um, that I've had uh, 
several meetings with the mayor in regards to the entire auditorium, including the floors, the stage, and things like that. So those are all items that we have identified. I can't say for sure what specifically that, uh, that funding would address, but I know they are repairing those spaces. Um, I don't think it calls for entire painting of the walls and those types of things, but we've certainly identified that as uh, needing to be improved as part of the whole Wigan Auditorium uh, changes. So, so I guess the answer to my question is, what you see is what you're gonna get. Basically, they're gonna patch the bad spots and they're going to paint over the bad spots. We're not gonna redo the, any of the paint and the main ceiling. Um, it's just gonna be basically a little bit of patchwork. I, I hope we didn't have to spend too much on that because uh, that original grant was for how much? Uh, I believe the grant was for $140,000. So I would think for $140,000 we get more than the patchwork that we do get some of the restoration because the paint is peeling in a lot of places and it's not going to get any better. And I think we as a city can do a lot better than that in terms of making sure that the entire hall is done at one point in time. But I know we're starting with this. I'm thrilled we're starting. And I don't want, I don't look to, I don't, don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, but in the same vein, um, part of what I thought the delay was because of the grandness of the scope, the heights of the ceilings, and the difficulty associated with that, that it was taking time to get the vendors and this, and, and we had also said at one point in time, I was in a uh, meeting and I know you weren't there at the time, but I was in a meeting at the, in the mayor's office, and he was very specific that we want to do this once right. And so I, I hope that if this is the first stage, then the, the, the next stages follow through very quickly, and we do this once right, get this to be a great haul, and it can be a great revenue producer. It will pay for itself ten times over the investment that we have to make to restore it. Um, just in events, we, we, we've hired an event manager to take care of the black box in here. And the idea is, and we've put in a state-of-the-art AV system, although sometimes we have a little bit of the art in using the, the uh, sound system. But the idea was we were going to use this hall on a frequented basis for concerts, movies, family nights, even as a venue that you could possibly rent for weddings and other things. And so I think we can only do that if we make the full investment, not just a patchwork. So I appreciate the update, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping that more, more to follow. Thank you. And just to, on a side note, with the grant application actually did include audio visual. So for the 140,000 just wasn't for the ceiling. It also included that other work as well. Right, but just for your clarification, there was another $90,000 that was left over from roof money that was allocated to the auditorium, specifically earmarked because we, sh we, we were under budget on the roof. And then there was also supposed to be some effort made with the CPA to get additional money put in. And you know, I, I just don't want to let it go. I really don't. So I get what you're saying. Um, and by the way, the council had also approved $50,000 for the AV system. So to say everything's coming out of that 147 is, I think, a little bit of a misnomer. And I, again, I don't blame you because you weren't here, but I want to make sure that the accounting of this is correct and that all the monies that were due to be put into the place are put into the place because that's what we as council has voted for. Any other councilors on this subject? If I may, I couldn't agree with Councilor Gravel more. Um, we have one shot to do this right. And Kurt, Mr. Bellavance, can you get back to us as to how, what the scope of repair is and whether there's an intent to do this, all the repairs over and then do some, some additional paint work or whatever has to be done to do this thing right. Could you get back to us at our next meeting, please? Yes. Is that okay, Councillor? Councillor Gravel, if I may, um, we're going on to the next subject, and Councillor McGinn has showed up. Is that okay if you 
relinquish? See, <clears throat> see, you make a comment like that, they kick you off the committee. <laughs> this, this is why they threw me off this committee in the first place. Thank you for your graciousness, Councillor Gravel. Mr. Bellavance, item C, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Gold. The uh, next item, uh, which is a proposed uh, zoning amendment change, would be uh, for what had been before the committee is filming and production companies. Just get... So right currently we do not have a, a definition of a, uh, a studio in regards to filming uh, movies or television or commercials, that type of uh, item. Uh, within the uh, Mr. Bellavance, so, sorry to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. uh, did you skip on C update regarding review of zoning maps and corresponding use tables? That's B. Yeah. <laughs> you my... made reference to C, so I've... <laughs> it was. You have one behind. I got the wrong one. Exactly. It's in my package. Mr. Bellavance, you're up. Item C, please. Thank you. Item, come on. Are you doing use tables? Are you? Item, item B was under a motion that was made uh, by, I believe, Councillor Gould as part of a subcommittee. So that's something I'm working on. So I don't, um, something I'm, I'm in the process of putting together. So that's really the update. I don't, I don't have anything to present before Very the good. City Council. Very we'll good. Then we'll leave that open. Thank you, sir. So now we're going to item C on the revised list or item D for those who may have the wrong sheet. We're talking proposed zoning amendments for filming and production companies. It's all yours. Thank you. Uh, so in regards to uh, item C, which is uh, a change in the, in the zoning uh, ordinance, it's regards to defining what we would call a studio. Uh, which would be for motion pictures and television filming. Currently, we have within the uh, zoning ordinance uh, broadcast studio, which you would refer to as maybe a radio station or, or a television, like Channel 5, Channel 7, that type of thing. But it doesn't, doesn't reference actual studio, which you would uh, have some filming in. Um, so what we want to do is put together a definition of that and then basically show where that that use would be allowed under the use table. Uh, this basically, it's, it's defining a use as within a structure, so it's a use which would be filming, uh, whether it had to do with commercials, television, movies, that type of stuff, what you'd normally think of as a, as a studio, Paramount, Universal, that type of thing. So it would allow that to go uh, within one of the uh, three industrial zoned areas uh, within the city. So it's basically a uh, industrial type of use. They would typically would need higher ceilings, or larger open spaces within the building so that they could do sound stages and that type of thing. So basically we wanted to have that definition in there so if, if a production company studio uh, type use wanted to come to the city, we have identified uh, the areas of the city in which they, would, um, they, would, could, they could go. And so I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Yes. Any questions, Councillors? Councillor McGinn, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, out of the main package, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, under suspension of the rules, move to receive item 8I that pertains to this matter. So moved. the motion by Councillor McGinn. All in favor? Any opposed? It's a vote. Councillor McGinn, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, three to Mr. Bellavance. Uh, when I, you know, this, this looks pretty uh, straightforward. Um, the only thing I was wondering is, um, was the question asked to the city solicitor with respect to, um, you know, we have an adult zone established in zoning, and um, I'd hate to see something like this used as an, as an end around to to the isolation of, of uh, adult uses uh, as they exist today. So when I, I, I hate to come, I hate to sound cynical, but you know, when ad adult films or things like things of that nature, um, I know are addressed to some extent in, 
in that section of zoning. Um, but I, I would want to be, I would, I'd be feel more comfortable if I know it was vetted by the solicitor to know that there was no uh, risk associated with uh, somehow uh, uh, circumventing the, the uh, zoning as it exists today with respect to those types of uses. So I, the, the simple question is, was, was that question asked? And, it, and if not, would you have any objection to, uh, to doing that before we act on this? Uh, yeah, that specific question was not asked, but it was brought up as a, um, a concern or something to review as possible, uh, you know, to make sure that we wouldn't fall under something like that. Uh, so it was discussed with the city solicitor, but the, we didn't come to a resolution at that time. But it was just, it was brought up to uh, the city solicitor at that time. And I wouldn't have any objections to having him come back and, and provide any additional language if it was needed. Yeah, well, I, I thank you for, for vetting that. Um, I'd feel more comfortable if that conversation was brought to closure and we knew definitively from the solicitor that there was no, uh, uh, pardon the pun, but exposure to, to um, uh, jeopardizing the uh, existing limitations on those types of uses and zoning today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bellavance, can you get back to us on that question, please, with city solicitor? Yes. We're going to go from the end. I, I, all three went up at the same. Councilor Manning Martin, did you have a question or no? Okay, Councilor Rosignol, please. I, I'll actually yield to Councilor, Councilor Turco, Turco, please. Uh, thank you. Um, in regards to um, sending this back to the city solicitor, I. I I understand, Council McGinn, I understand fully your, uh, your concern with it. Now, my concern um, is that th there is some serious interest in, in several buildings of the office park now um, that are under time constraints. And I was, you know, if we do send this to the solicitor, um, I, I would like to get this back on the agenda uh, very, very quickly. As, as a matter of fact, maybe even it possibly if we could at the next meeting so that uh, we can get this the zoning created so that we don't then prevent ourselves from, um, you know, the, the use of, like I said, a couple buildings in the we, office park. So. Thank you, Councilor. The, the clerk has advised me that we can schedule a subcommittee for this issue for the industrial community development on the 12th, which is our next scheduled meeting, and we should act 13th. 13th, excuse me, and we should act on it that night. Thank you. And, and with that, it would be three weeks from um, the time we vote on the 13th for that ordinance to take effect? Is it, is it no? I believe this is a zoning amendment, so we would have to go through planning board hearing, city council hearing. So you're probably looking at a couple of months. Thank you. If that's the process, then that process is what it is. Thank you. Any other councilors, please? Councilor Manning Martin, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, there's a reference to a film liaison in this document, but there's no definition of film liaison offered. Um, the last time I had come before, I believe it was the subcommittee, there were two items that I had them take a look at. One was a film policy, and then one was defining a film studio. The policy itself, the subcommittee had given me feedback and said that that wasn't necessary to bring that back to the council because it wasn't under the council's purview because it was just a policy. So what I did was I incorporated those um, uh, requests and suggestions into the policy uh, to, to modify that, but we haven't, that's not anything we have implement, implemented yet because we haven't had any interest in filming. That was, that was for outside, so if you were going to film our, you know, Emerson Park or those types of things, we haven't had that, so we haven't really hadn't found it necessary to use that yet, but it was um, the film liaison, which was a position that the Mass Office of Tourism and Film, I believe, had established and asked communities if they were interested in working with the state 
on that, that they would identify a film liaison. So we had done that a, a few years ago. Um, and so basically it's when, when production companies reach out to the state to do filming, they send out a uh, email uh, to those people that are identified as film liaisons, um, which would be myself and Chris Ryan, and then then, okay. we, then we'd work with them. So, so to cut to the chase, I was making sure we weren't creating a new position. No, no, no. Okay, no. so it's a responsibility that's going to fall under existing staff. Yes, that yes. title and yeah. that responsibility. Yeah. Excellent, thank okay. you. And uh, the I'm just wondering if. It seems, in some cases, a little uh, tedious, so maybe restrictive on um, the permission of the use of the property, that how many forms need to be signed for every private property used in the film location. You're not including properties that are seen in the background or anything, are you? Uh, no, and again, that was the policy that they, that the subcommittee had made a uh, recommend we haven't really implemented that yet so it's still with changes made and drafts made we haven't really had the opportunity to to meet with someone that wants to film to, to see how it works so and under the same uh, guys would be that under noticing requirement that the film location shall receive a written notice from the film 24 hours prior to the start. That seems like you're not giving people much time to me. Um, I don't know if you make, make it 48 or 72 or I don't know, a week. That just seems to be not realistic, just 24 hours. So that, those are just my thoughts. Thank you very much. Yes, I think, I think that was something that we did look at changing or did change, so. Rosignol, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, PAT will not be part of this contract. That'll be exempt. That'll be completely separate, correct? Right. So <laughs> the, the, the film policy and the, and the zoning change are two separate items. So when I had come before the uh, subcommittee before, I brought both of them up, and the subcommittee said, no, this isn't anything that the, the council would really act on. They made suggestions, and I, I took that off the plate. So what's before the city council, the subcommittee now, is just the, to change a film studio, which would be a use inside a building. And all that, the film policy is, is a separate item, so. Just, just where it says students and right. that whole thing, and I know they do a lot of work with PAT. I just didn't want a student having to have to come to City Hall in order to get a permit right. if it's something that they're doing A through school or B through PAT. So I just wanted to make sure that that was completely separate and exempt from this moving forward. Yeah, I believe that comment was brought up before and yes. And um, secondly, under film permitting application requirements, there's no penalty for not following these rules. There's no fines system or fee system set up so that if it's not followed, if it's not, if they haven't come to City Hall to apply for a permit, there's no fee structure or fine structure for not doing business properly. That's one thing I would like to see in this. Thank you. All right, yeah. Any other councils? Council McGinn, please. Just, just a comment to Mr. Bellavance, because I can see from the, the look on your face that you're surprised you're getting some of these questions. I think the confusion is stemming from the fact that the policy made its way back into our packages, even though that's not before us. So that's why you're getting these questions, even though that's not the agenda item. Right. So that's... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the clarification. Any other questions? If not, we'll go to item D, Artist Studios and Galleries. Mr. Bellavance, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, uh, a similar uh, change to uh, we're looking to do uh, within the zoning ordinances to provide a definition uh, for art use. Um, right now, if someone was going to do a, a studio or a gallery, it really just falls under um, 
like a retail type of use, so which is base, basically be permitted in, in the general business district. Uh, we want to uh, actually kind of define that uh, and allow uh, art uh, studios and uh, galleries uh, in other areas uh, throughout the city. Um, so what we wanted to do is, um, and I, I believe at the last subcommittee meeting, the, we had had a general uh, definition of that, and it was recommended that I uh, look at some other communities to see what and how other communities address it. Uh, so there were about a dozen other communities that I took a look at how they defined art and art use and art studios and galleries and such. And uh, basically, uh, I, what I did was I put together the language that I thought would best fit uh, the city of Peabody. And then I de identified the, um, basically most of the uh, commercial uses to allow uh, an art studio or art gallery uh, to allow them to go in those, those districts. Uh, typically, they're, um, they're not very obtrusive uh, uses. Uh, they, we're hoping that uh, we'll possibly get some uh, similar uses downtown. Uh, uh, typically, it attracts people. It would attract people in the evening if you had a gallery opening and those types of things. So it's another um, a way of looking at trying to address something that wasn't defined in the zoning ordinance and try to put that in place. And as part of um, to anticipate a, a potential question in regards to uh, adult uses and that type of thing, I did have that a similar conversation with the city solicitor in regards to that, and it was, again, b both actual um, zoning changes to talk about that, and it's something that I can certainly go back to him and talk about it in, in more depth. Councilor McGinn, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on this one, I'd, under suspension of the rules, move to receive item 8J from the uh, regular meeting package, so moved. With the motion by Councilman McGinn, all in favor, any opposed, it's a vote. Councilman McGinn, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Bellavance, thank you for anticipating that question. Uh, it, it, precisely the same concern. Um, certain, of, certain of those adult uses that are restricted now under Section 6.5 of zoning, uh, you know, have uh, constitutionally protected free speech rights. So it's a, it's a sticky matter. I think it's, and I appreciate the fact that you'll further vet it with the solicitor. Um, one additional question or comment on this is, um, you know, given that, uh, you know, I would agree a gallery opening, so forth, that type of thing is, is, is fairly innocuous, and, um, but they're, the composition of music um, that can that can create disturbances where there's close proximity, particularly to residences. Uh, and there's three zoning districts in here um, that commingle closely with with residential uses, oh, which is BN2, uh, BC, and BN. Um, so the request uh, for my part would be to, uh, if this advances, to amend the proposal uh, to al allow it in those districts by special permits so that we can evaluate the potential for any of those issues. Um, and then other than that, in the other districts, allow it by right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You making that in the form of a motion? Ms. Ms. No, it's, it's constructive input to the, to the uh, Mr. Bellavance, and I see him nodding to the affirmative, so it's, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm taking from that that he is seeing that as reasonable input. Um, is that, that is, am I understanding your body language correctly? Yes, I mean, they're all different forms of art, so it's, that's certainly reasonable to have that take a look at a little bit more closely. Yep. Councilors, Councilor Melville, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, there was just a, when I saw, uh, Creating film, uh, and I, I, Googled, I saw a couple other communities had something similar. Um, would that? I mean, is, to me, that's just something that's a that's kind of a gray, a, a gray area. Um, you know, I think a little definition on that as well. I know some other communities have had something similar, where it was, 
you know, is it an act being filmed or is there a, some sort of, you know, what, what, is that, what does that entail, I think is important. Um, the only reason I say that is because much of what we're seeing here is either going to attract people for sale of a, of a certain item or uh, for some sort of artistic display or performance. Um, so I, I just think that, that particular one, and from talking to a couple of communities that had this issue that I did speak to on it, that I, uh, colleagues of mine, uh, they did say that, that that was something that they ran into in the internet age. Um, the second issue uh, I just wanted to talk about, bring up, is some of this would, you know, with a business liaison or with yourself, some of these would require certain permitting for resale, I'm assuming, based on the products they'd be purchasing and then for resale. Um, was that something that your office would be in taking a look at? The reason I say this, we're now zoning something that we probably have f permits that are issued for certain activities that could be taking place at those areas. Is that something that you've taken into account? Yes, and certainly, I mean, what we hope to promote it would be if anybody's producing something in their studio, say in the back, they may have classes, they may produce something, and then they have a small retail area out front that they'd be able to sell, then sell those products, whether it's a, whether it's a painting, a sculpture, or some other kind of artwork. And I think uh, this is, I mean, I'm glad we got this language, I'm glad we're putting this together. Art in general is a just a, it's a very broad description. It's a very broad area. What some people consider art, some people might not. Um, so I think it's a good idea to button this up. Uh, but those are just my two comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Any other counselors, please? All right, nothing more than we'll go to, by the way, Mr. Bellavance, on these, we, all, we have a number of open items. We'll, you'll continue to work them and come back to us when, okay, thank you. Uh, item E, proposed zoning amendment, multifamily residential. Mr. Bellavance, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Gould. There are actually two items that fall under uh, E. Uh, one of them, uh, and it relates to uh, a zoning change for multifamily dwelling within the R2. I'm going to, um, I'm working on that. I have uh, additional information that I'd like to work in, in modifying that. So. I'm not going to, with your uh, allow, I'll That's just remove fine. that. Yep. Thank you. Is there Thank anything else under that item? So the, and then the next item um, is the uh, residential development uh, proposed uh, language uh, in regards to creating a residential overlay uh, district. Um, I'd like to, uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is uh, through Basically, uh, planning in the last, I'm going to say, 10 to 12 years, um, it's been a, a priority of both um, the planning field as well as uh, the last three governors, uh, Republican and Democrat, that we're, um, we're falling short of our housing needs uh, within Massachusetts. Um, and the... Uh, the attempt to create more housing in regards to that is one of the reasons why um, I've put this together to try to move uh, forward in regards to allowing additional opportunities for residential development within the city. Um, it's different than it's not a um, mixed use uh, type of overlay. Uh, it's a proposal of uh, residential development within a commercial district. So there would be, you would be mixed uh, residential with uh, commercial properties, uh, but the type of residential uh, projects we're looking at would be more of a transitional uh, zone between uh, commercial and your traditional neighborhoods. So it's something that instead of, you know, and we do that, the, the two areas that we're looking at are Route 1 and 114, and as we're, we're all familiar with, uh, those are uh, a lot of commercial activity on those two, uh, two corridors with a lot of residential neighborhoods behind those corridors uh, in regards to uh, having access onto Route 1 or access onto 114. And typically, we, it's either an if, it's either this or that, which is a commercial development, uh, 
and it's usually abutting a residential. So part of this is to allow for a residential, which is uh, partially commercial project because it's multifamily, but allowing a transitional uh, type of use between the, the traditional neighborhood and a commercial corridor. So in that sense, it is a uh, sort of a mixed use type of proposal, but not necessarily a mixed use uh, development. Um, so that's one of the, uh, the reasons that those uh, areas have been identified for uh, potential uh, growth in this area. Um, and as I had mentioned before, it's been uh, an issue uh, increasing ever so much in, 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 in the planning field uh, as well. Um, it's recognized, as I said before, by, at the state level that we're, uh, we need to produce about a half a million uh, residential units in the next 20 years, uh, basically to meet uh, the goals of, of what our youth is looking to, uh, to do. Um, you may have uh, uh, one of the younger uh, folks in your family or know somebody that traditionally um, uh, the younger generation, which is a population 21 to 30, which is the only declining population in Massachusetts right now. Uh, that, and the number one reason for them uh, leaving Massachusetts is housing. Um, so, what now, so what they're doing now is uh, they've found that uh, that cohort is either living with their parents longer, uh, they're needing to get roommates uh, to live somewhere, uh, or they're just commuting longer distances to stay uh, within Massachusetts. So it's, it's, a, it's an issue that, uh, that we've seen in the planning field uh, as well, and something that we want to address. Um, so the, the issue of creating a, uh, this uh, district is to allow, as I said before, a transition between residential and commercial properties. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the areas that we want to focus on is allowing access uh, to these properties, but, but restricting access that would go into the traditional neighborhoods. Uh, so one of the reasons why the, uh, the, the two corridors were part of that. Um, the, another uh, issue that we've, uh, that we've seen is uh, there hasn't been, we haven't seen a lot of uh, residential uh, or larger residential developments in the city of Peabody uh, really since about 2005. Uh, there was a plethora of uh, residential developments done in the early 2000s, some projects decent, some projects not so good. Um, I know a lot of the concerns are, you know, we're going to bring more kids to the schools. But in that time period, uh, the actual school enrollment has dropped about 637 students, which is almost 10%. Uh, so we don't see, and those are about the time those, a lot of those projects were coming online. So we haven't seen that huge increase in, in school uh, enrollment as well. So sort of the background of, um, of putting this project uh, together or, or the request before the council to, uh, to create uh, additional opportunities for zoning is to create this, um, this overlay. And the main um, uh, design behind this is, is, is like it's the main design, the main purpose of this is to uh, prevent poor development and look for better development. So this document is loaded with basically design standards that the, that the projects have to meet. And I'll go through uh, the language uh, and give you some uh, sense of what we are looking at when we put this together and then you can, you can ask some questions. Um, this is, it's designed to, for new structures only, so we're not looking to uh, convert existing buildings. Uh, we're looking to see new structures, modern um, amenities, uh, better construction materials, and so forth. Um, the process still has to follow along site plan review, which would be going before the planning board as well, before coming before the city council as a special permit. Um, the, within the dimensional requirements, we put in additional setback if the property is adjacent to an existing residential uh, dwelling. Uh, so that way uh, we understand that we don't want to in, uh, in interfere with existing uh, single family homes uh, as part of that process. Um, one of the other items highlighted uh, under section G is that the, um, the city council as the special permit granting authority would uh, also be allowed to waive dimensional requirements if they see a, um, a need for any public uh, projects that are supported in that area. And there may be additional um, 
uh, infrastructure uh, issues that you want to address and allow those things to happen so that we don't want to build a project that's not going to meet, um, it's not going to be basically perform uh, within the requirements of what we have already for our infrastructure. Um, the other item is that it's, uh, it's limited to two, uh, two bedroom units, so it wouldn't allow for uh, three bedroom units, which is the uh, typical trend now we, that we see anyway. They're looking mostly at uh, studios, one bedrooms, and two bedrooms. Uh, that leads into the, uh, the site design criteria, which is basically the meat of, of, the, of the ordinance proposal. Uh, basically, we're, we're encouraging um, we're encouraging the use of this uh, so that it sits within a commercial district, as I said before. So typically you'll see a larger multifamily project uh, and it'll be in a commercial district, but we want to have it serve more of a, as a transitional between that and a traditional uh, neighborhood. Um, the, also, we want to limit uh, curb cuts and access to existing neighborhoods. Uh, so it lists, you know, reducing the number of curb cuts so that we're not, we're not basically plopped right down in the middle of a residential area where they're exiting and entrancing right into a, a traditional neighborhood. Um, again, it goes on to identify that, the, um, that this special permit that would be granted by the city council is based on the, the applicant demonstrating that they meet these requirements, uh, especially, and then it goes into more specific things about exterior uh, building materials and colors, which we don't traditionally ask for, uh, but it's something that when you build a project and spend additional money on it, it's, it's a project that's going to last, it's going to look better, uh, it's going to basically be a better product uh, for the city of Peabody. Continue again, we talk about access and, and, and reducing um, curb cuts and access into, uh, uh, into traditional neighborhoods. We also talk about uh, parking and screening parking. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that any, any of the utilities, the uh, trash receptacles, parking, so forth, are screened. So that again, if you're, this is again serving as a transition between uh, commercial and residential, that we want to have those screening in place to set that more residential tone uh, versus a uh, commercial tone. Uh, and that's basically how the, some of the language draws out. I don't want to go through every single item, but I'd be happy to, uh, to answer your questions in regards to that. Um, uh, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, and I th yeah, that's it for now. I'd be happy to uh, answer any of your Thank questions. Thank you, Mr. Belovich. You, you, you did a nice job presenting that. Thank you. A lot of information. Councilor Turco, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to um, Mr. Bellavance, you, you did an excellent job on it, and, and it, my, my opinions are, are differing from, and you've all heard me on my soapbox. You know, I look at the population of the city of Peabody, and, and if you look at the vast majority, have come from Revere, Chelsea, Malden, East Boston, um, Lynn, Salem, Beverly, and they've influxed into Peabody. And I just think that that influx was largely due to the fact that those people saw what was happening in their communities with excess construction, excess building, and I don't think that's what the people of Peabody want. I think they came here because uh, it, it's a sleepy town, to say the least. It's a nice town to, to live in, a lot of single-family homes. It's, you know, it's a great place. But let me get to um, the real reasons why I don't support it. In the last month, we have had infrastructure meetings. Um, one, we just approved the $2.7 million loan for a water, uh, to address water pressure issues up by Red's Tavern. Uh, we haven't done that yet. That needs to be addressed before we start talking about building on 114 and Route 1. Um, if I had known at the time I voted on that $2.7 million loan that we were building um, the project on Dearborn Road with 180 apartments, I may have asked that there be some offsite mitigation from that apartment complex to help alleviate some of the water issues. I didn't know that um, at the time. Secondly, we've had meetings with Ty and Bond in the last month um, regarding sewage improvements that are required under MS4. We haven't done any of those. We haven't even gotten the final list 
um, of how many sewer, sewer lines need to be improved throughout the city of Peabody. Um, an additional meeting that many of us attended in, ward, in Council Charest Ward regarding water pressure issues. Um, major work needs to be done to our, our water lines in the city of Peabody. Uh, we're way ahead of ourselves with doing this kind of construction in the city of Peabody right now. Um, I, I'm going to go on. Uh, we have one water treatment plant that was supposed to be open a month ago, still not open, no word on when it's going to open. We have another water treatment plant that we know is antiquated, needs to be rebuilt. Um, haven't gotten there yet, but we want to add 5,000 people to the population, we can't bring drinking water to them? It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, current projects, uh, Birch Hill in West Peabody in Ward 6, 24 houses, Stonegate in South Peabody, 24 houses. Those are before the planning board and the planning departments. The people that receive the majority of the calls regarding those projects are this group right here. We, we get them, but we have no control over that planning. And I understand you've given us a little semblance of control with the special permit process that will still go before planning and planning rules and regulations. And a lot of it will, will get thrown at us and we'll get the phone calls as to why these apartment buildings are there, and just like we, we are with Stonegate and Birch Hill. Um, for the record, to, to anybody that's watching, I, I have very little control over either one of those projects. You, you know that. I could throw in my, my recommendations all day long. So can't Councilor O'Neill. It's likely um, going to have little effect on, on what they do there. Um, I'm convinced, and I can only speak for Stonegate, Stonegate's going to exasperate a lot of issues in South Peabody. That's 24 homes with a lot of blasting. That water, that runoff needs to be addressed. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, last Sunday we had uh, some flooding situations. Due to eight inches of rain, I get that. Um, and I saw the areas that were affected. And those areas that were affected were all due to projects that we approved. And when I say we, we as a city approved. And, and I'll go through. Boulderwood um, on Bartholomew Street. The runoff, whether it was or wasn't caused um, down on Mountain Terrace, I'm sure most people saw the videos. Uh, Granite Road. Granite Road has been there forever. Granite Road Extension was a project approved 20 years ago, which then exasperated the flooding on, on Granite because it comes downhill toward them. Boulderwood comes from the other direction. It floods Granite Road in, in Mountain Terrace. Uh, Murphy Road, new subdivision built by Cal Krupe, uh, you know, eight houses, flooded the next street over Orchard Terrace. Uh, that was another area I was in last Sunday. We've done better at addressing some of these uh, through retention ponds, detention basins. There's only so many places we could put the water in this city. It's streams, it's rivers, it's, it's, it is what it is. I mean, this is, this is where we live. It, at some point, we're going to put ourselves in a corner with nowhere else to put the water. And every time we build, we move it on to somewhere else. Um, current projects in the works, uh, I'll go back to that. Birchill, Stonegate, Dearborn Road, 180 apartments. Oak Street apartments are still questionable whether that's 60 or 80 in Wood 2. Uh, one Main Street's building apartments. The other section of Main Street down by McDonald's, they're building apartments. Boulderwood still has an additional 40 homes to build. We have a friendly 40B going up behind Sonic on Route 1. I, that's a lot of housing, and that's without this zoning change. Uh, if, if these people want to build, they can, you know, and we're not within our 10%, then let them file for the 40B and not make a sweeping zoning, zoning change without, throughout the whole city. Um, one that I missed, Litchfield, eight houses built on Bartholomew Street. Guess what? A resident approached me in 2015 and said, you built those eight houses. They put storm drains in the middle of sidewalks um, that do nothing. They, they still have yet to finish the curbing in front of the eight houses um, to finish off the city curbing in the front. This was all part of this project. All left went, went un unchecked. And now you, you, you know, you, you, again, not toward you, but the city would like us to say, let's build apartments and we'll, we'll check everything and we'll make sure it's okay. Well, no, it's not because Antonio Drive, $700,000 houses off of Linfield Street. There's two vacant lots, uh, again, built by Cal Krupe, two vacant lots that abut Linfield Street. I can't get the guy to come down and mow the, the vacant lots. Councilor O'Neill will probably deal with this very shortly over in Birch Hill. Um, I begged the guy. There's nothing in there that says he has to mow those lots, but you know, when people drive down Linfield Street, what do they see? They see overgrown weeds, um, at the beginning of a $700,000 subdivision. Quail Road, uh, I spent a, a, an adequate amount of time at Quail Road on Sunday. Quail Road is built, Quail and Robin, directly around Goldwaith Brook. Goldwaith Brook surrounds the entire subdivision. That was built, again, years ago, and we've gotten better at it, but what did we do? We, we, we built things that are gonna flood. And again, I'll, I'll finish with the fact that 
no matter where you put these projects, we don't have the infrastructure to support them. We don't have the ability to, to retain any more water than, than we do, maybe in limited amounts. I just think that we're, we're well ahead of where we, knew we, we need to be. If you come back in another two years and, and we've done a lot of this infrastructure work, maybe my mind changes. But as of right now, I, I just don't see any reason for it. And I apologize for the lengthy uh, monologue, but I'm a little passionate about the issue. You came through loud and clear, Councillor Turco. Any other councillors? Councillor Melville, then Councillor Gravel. Councillor Melville, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, one, you know, when I was looking at the actual zoning for this, uh, what the areas that are going to be impacted, you know, I was concerned, and I am concerned about a couple of things. Uh, one, I did communicate to Mr. Bellavance, which is, you know, the people that live on. Uh, Lake Street, Pine Street, uh, Winona, you know, there's quite a bit of traffic that flows in and out of Route 1 from already relatively congested neighborhoods and narrow streets, not built for, essentially they were farmland and they've been converted into feeding onto Route 1. Um, and I, and I, when I look at this, and I'm, again, I'm not a real estate uh, broker or uh, in by any means, but I, I feel like a, a lot of the value would have of, the, of some of that property that we're talking about would be those that would feed off into those uh, non Route One streets, uh, essentially to get either to go to school, the supermarket, all the things you want to do without having to uh, get onto a major highway. Um, so that's concerning. Uh, on that note, um, the other issue, and I, this is a question, um, you know, when when you look at the uh, North Shore Mall, um, you know, I think it's really imperative as a community with where you see retail, uh, the retail stores going as we, uh, as of right now in this market, um, that we start to be as competitive as possible with retaining, um, you know, some of those dollars by, you know, if it's not through retail, if those box stores go out of business, well, how are we going to fill them? And we've seen such success that occurred out in West Peabody. Um, in the uh, big Y Plaza, filling those, but you know, I, I do, I am concerned about that, and I, and, and I do believe that, that at least the North Shore Mall um, does that area does have the access exit and access routes. It has the the, the land to uh, hold some of. I mean, have, outside of this particular zoning, is there any other remedy that you could see to give yourself uh, just another tool for the toolbox for community development when if this continue this market where we see these big retail box stores that really th they anchor the mall um, start going out of business on how um, we could fill those it, it, do we have to is there some sort of zoning change specific to that area or what, what would you what have you looked at thus far I mean I know you have this in front of us right now that would inc would, would would do that so in regards to other uses specifically uh, for the mall um, I it, there's an overabundance of retail commercial space, and they've, I think the, the number is a billion square feet in the United States. That's just, could you get rid of it and you wouldn't even notice. And the Simon Mall Group understand that, and they're looking to change the uses basically to, to have a two-way active use uh, within that. And you're seeing more restaurants, you want to see some kind of entertainment type of uses, so they're looking at that as well. But on the other side of that, they look at uh, the residential piece because of the reasons you just mentioned, that it's access. You have a lot of parking, uh, you have uh, uses that aren't necessarily um, continuing the way they used to be in, in, the, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, so they're looking at other alternatives, and one of those is, uh, is residential because it's access to major highways. It's right there where you get on and off in, in several different directions. And uh, certainly that's one of the other ones that they're looking at and is one of the reasons why we included that in. But the retail group itself, and we're lucky to have Simon, a large, uh, large uh, company like that, a large um, base, that they're looking at a, a lot of different options and, and, and trying to create different uses. Similar to, it's great if, you had, if we had Microsoft come here and say, yeah, we're going to come here and build and have 50,000 jobs, but if they leave one day, you're out 50,000. So what you try to do is spread it around to have all different types of uses. So now the mall, instead of solely relying on residential, they're looking at other uses as well to try to keep that model going. Also, I mean, you know, the one point on this, and you probably heard me say this before, that con another concern I had within it was, you know, I don't want to expand some of the uh, 
the, uh, the, some of these properties or the buildings that are already there. I, I think, as Councillor Turco pointed out, you know, I, I was driving around the city when that storm hit a couple a couple Sundays ago, and I, I, you know, I am concerned about extend, you know, extending some of what is already commercial space that's impervious, it's cement um, in those areas. Um, I think that there is a real threat. I mean, we saw what happened. Um, to that property, uh, I believe it's off of Winona, with the mudslides and, and everything else that occurred there, because essentially, you know, Route One was built as a as a highway, whereas really wasn't with the idea of having, you know, housing along it. And I know other communities adopting it, um, but that is a concern I have: is basically is the extension of what is already a footprint of some of these buildings that um, could there, there is a residential neighborhoods behind these places. Let's face it. Um, so, you know, that is, that's a major concern of mine. So, from my perspective, um, looking at this, I think there's some places where, you know, this is a viable thing that we got to start discussing, whether it be in the mall area, um, of course not, you know, it, from a, that it is, it is viable, um, because there's going to, you're not really, you wouldn't have to extend much of a footprint, and you would still be utilizing what is our most important tax revenue generator, uh, and we got to keep that. Um, but you know, Route One, I think, is a, is a tough spot with a, with the with the roads coming off of it, along with um, you know the the nature of that it is currently exists. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Sure, Count, uh, Mr. Bellavance, please. Okay, thank you, thank you. The uh, the proposal we're not looking at um, changing development. So the, the issues that come up in regards to water and infrastructure and all those, that's a development issue. It's not a residential issue. So I don't want to specifically say we're looking at housing as being bad when another type of use can be developed there as well and draw possibly even more traffic in regards to that type of, uh, of unit. So we're looking at an additional use that could be allowed in that district. Um, part of the, the, the item that I listed here was to um, to highlight the support of public projects, because that's something definitely we would want them to address, is water, sewer, um, runoff, or those types of things. Those, that's basically the number one item that we would be looking for as part of a project being proposed. Um, certainly anything along Route 1, yes, we want them to, uh, to address the water issues and the sewer issues there as well. And in fact, we've uh, you know, started discussions as well as trying to um, to look at how we're going to, how, do, how can we model that, and so that we have basically a formula in place, so that when projects come before us, we already have something in place. So it's not kind of a, a guess of how we handle this or what should we do. It's a, it's a basically a policy and a standard in place that as projects come forward, we have that available for them. But a lot of the issues that that we, you started talking about are, are development issues in general. They're not necessarily targeted toward residential, and in this case the design features of this are trying to help prevent that and soften that in regards to a big box coming in on, on Route 1 or 114 and just basically they're allowed use, they come in, they put their parking in and, and there's, there's no review at all whatsoever. Uh, so this is part of why we want to incorporate that design, um, those design guidelines. So. Thank you, Mr. Bellavance. Councillor Gravel, please. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm not, a, I'm not on the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on it. Um, First of all, I love uh, Councilor Turco's uh, passion. It was uh, kind of fun to listen to. And uh, uh, I hear his concerns. I don't necessarily agree with them all, but I hear them. And uh, uh, frankly, uh, starting from what makes up this city, people from all those other communities, I I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that. Uh, but I do know what brought a lot of people to this community was the development that occurred in the 60s and 70s when we moved most of the farmland and the factory land into, uh, you know, residential homeland. And uh, that brought a lot of people. And it brought a lot of infrastructure requirements. And, you know, I, I hate to sound old, but, I mean, I, I can remember a time when, you know, my graduating class was 730 students. And it wasn't the largest. And, you know, our schools were filled to the gills. And we made some mistakes about which schools to build and all of that. And the same arguments, I'm sure, occurred then as occurred now. Taxing our infrastructure, overusing our properties, et cetera. Um, but I do think, um, and all those deserve the, same, the, the passion of the, of the argument that he's presenting as it pertains to 
why we shouldn't do this in carte blanche. But my understanding of an overlay is specifically to look at areas where we're possibly underutilizing or misutilizing the property based on the zoning requirement for it and specifically addressing that part of the map so that it wouldn't be all commercial land, it would be specified commercial land as an overlay with an allowance and this allowance is not by right but by special permit. So it does give additional tools um, for projects that might make a heck of a lot of sense. You know, I, I deal with, in my business, I deal with, uh, you know, companies like Flatley and Wynn and not Wynn the gambling company, but Wynn the property, residential property company, um, and a number of, of uh, you know, residential developers and, the, and the, the concept today, and I think we always have to think of where is everything going, the concept today is live, work, play. People don't want to commute long distances. That was totally different back in the day when the single family homes were being built in West Peabody. People were willing to commute it to, because the traffic situation wasn't what it is today. And you know, today what attracts commercial entities is residential capability in close proximity to where the people are going to work, where they're going to find their employees. And the millennials today aren't looking at, you know, I want to, you know, it's, it's a different world. I don't want a big house. I want a 500 square foot, 750 square foot loft. And I want to be within a commuting distance and I want to have transportation. I don't want to necessarily buy a car. I mean, and that's not all millennials, but it's, it's, it's a general trend, and it's why you're seeing developments even in Boston where right next to the garden, a, a residential development that averages between 500 and 750 square feet with rents that are going between 2,800 and 3,500 a month because there's a demand. And I think we, we can't ignore the demand, and we can't ignore the need for the infrastructure repairs that are in front of us. Listen. Along the way, somebody is always going to pay the price when, when, there, when there weren't enough, in my era, when there weren't enough schools, the city had to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in schools just to keep up. We're at a point in time where the infrastructure in our city is getting old. It's worn. It needs revitalization. I know the mayor is going to come to us with a water plant and a, and a lot of other things. And I, and I think, unfortunately, you know, in the ongoing life of a, of a city, you know, we're going to have to deal with that and we're going to have to address that. And we can't look at them all as just a singular one-off issues and say, well, you know, uh, that's a lot of money today. We can't do it because blah, 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 because all we're doing is deferring it. Just like when the schools were suffering, we deferred all the maintenance. We let them break down and then we had to rebuild them back up. I mean, if we do the same thing for our infrastructure, that's what we're going to have. So I think this is a very legitimate tool to utilize properties, you know, particularly in designated areas. I'd be curious as to the areas, because I think you know, the only concern I would have is I want to know where we're going to put this overlay before we put it. But outside of that, I think the, the concept of having an overlay capability is, is, is very valuable to us, because the only other methodology that we can use is to make sweeping changes across the board. So we have a district called a commercial district, and we can either say yes or no by special permit, and it affects every part. And I agree with Councilor Turkle. There are some parts of the city where I wouldn't want to see this, but there are other parts that I think maybe make some sense. But I, I, you know, at the time, if if we don't go forward with allowing the overlay, then there's no need to go forward with deciding where you're going to put the overlay. And I think. The idea is a good idea. I don't want to discourage you. I think it, it should be, you know, thought through. And yes, all those concerns that were brought up should be considered. But as you were saying, in relation to the projects and the places that you want these projects to occur, not necessarily to the concept, because I don't think the concept is objectionable, at least not to me. I know it is to him, but not to me. I think the concept makes a lot of sense to me, um, but it's a matter of where are you going to put it and you know, what kind of mitigation are they going to pay to, to make sure that they don't further impact all the concerns that he has. Thank you. Councilor Sharis, please. 
Thank you, Chairman. I realize I'm not part of this committee, so thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, like Council Turco, I am a ward councilor and very concerned with my ward and my neighborhoods. Uh, but with that being said, I think this proposal, what we'll be looking at, um, would not affect drastically the neighborhoods and the water infrastructure. Uh, as Mr. Belvalance talked about, we'll be addressing those issues with those type of developments that would be done. You know, is there the water infrastructure there, the sewer there, and what their in impact is going to happen, and what are they going to put into uh, the community to solve those issues? Three years ago, I sat here and um, this overlay concept had came up, and quite honestly, I, I, I didn't see it. I was in support of it. Council Gravel spoke about it and saying, hey, this is what the, the communities are looking for, this is what the folks is looking for, and you know, this is what people want. And I, didn't, I, I voiced my opinion that I didn't think it was the right move. I got home, I got blasted. I got blasted by my daughters and I got blasted by their friends and saying this is what's going on in Peabody. This is why Peabody, people are leaving. Their age brackets are leaving the city and going to Salem, Melrose. They want to live above commercial resident, um, retail operations, like Council Gravel spoke about. They want to be able to come home, park their car, not use it again, walk downstairs, go to the store, go to the restaurant, go to whatever businesses around them. Again, I think by pinpointing where we're going to use this overlay, it affects Ward 5, uh, excuse me, Ward 4 and Ward 5. I understand that. But I don't think it's going to have a, that large impact of these large developments. Look at the market right now. What houses are being sold quickly and over price, over, you know, um, sale price, set price, is the smaller homes. The larger homes are sitting on the market longer because people are starting to say, I don't need the five bedrooms when I only have one child or even no child. Okay? They're looking for that small impact. They are looking for the five, 600 square foot um, units. I'm surprised they're not starting to utilize the concepts they have in small houses the bathroom facilities they use, the uh, incinerators for the, the sewage. I can start seeing some of these facilities start using that. And you can you know, kind of squinch your face and say, oh, are you kidding me? Well, that small houses market is huge right now. And then if you're invested in it, you're doing quite well. The younger people have a good concept, they have a good idea, and they want to be above commercial. The other thing is, Developers, you're saying you want some good developers to come in. Good, smart, clean, and people who do it right. Well, those are saying, listen, I can't just do it on a commercial basis. I have to have a mix, I have to have a residential, and I have to have a commercial then. It doesn't, the commercial base doesn't support their mortgages any longer. So I do, I do support this, I came completely around in three years because I listened to what people were saying to me. I know the older folks here who've been living in the city for 40, 50 years are saying, Ed, the, the city is so busy. Yes, it is. And it is going to get busier as the state gets busier. Okay? But if we have a smart growth, and I think we have a man in charge right now who can make that happen, can keep an eye on how we should do, be doing things that doesn't have the impact, or if they don't, are going to build, they're going to build it right, and they're going to add to the facilities that we need. This is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sharks. Councillor Rosignol, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this map and this, this, so these zoning districts took over two years to formulate through a lot of hard work from council previous to ours. They put a lot of hard work into this, and I think by putting an overlay district that is so widespread, I, I don't think that that does this map service. So I will not be in favor of this. I do agree with Councilor Turco that our infrastructure needs to improve first before we can worry about an overlay district.
I also I want to commend um, Councilor Melville. I do agree that mixed use would be appropriate at a mall that's similar to what they have in Linfield Marketplace, where you have residents, you, ha you have, as, as Councilor Gravel put, your work, stay, and play all in that entity. I don't think you're going to have that type of work, stay, play, 20-somethings on Route 1. Where are they going to do? They're gonna, they can't walk on Route 1. They're not. The main reason why your 20-somethings are moving into Boston is so that they can walk downstairs and go get a beer. They can jump in an Uber and they can go to work all within five minutes. You don't have that in Peabody. You don't have that in a residential community. I, I think an overlay district at this point, I just don't see it as being a, a, a strong benefit to our city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rosenau. Councilor McGinn, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I tend to agree um, that the infrastructure issues that have been laid out um, quite well, I might add, by Councilor Turco are, are very legitimate, very real, and very near term. Uh, and, and, you know, that's something where we need to focus our attention, frankly, uh, before we take this on, which I think was the gist of um, Councilor Rosignol's suggestion. Um, you know, this was described as, as a transition from a commercial to a residential uh, district, but it's, I don't see it as creating a transitional district. I see it as creating a commingling of, of uses. And, you know, there are conflicts that happen uh, as, that, as those uses come into play. Residences, residents over time are going to develop issues with things that are going on with the com adjacent commercial use and so forth. And I know there was effort put into this as a planning document um, to try to minimize uh, that to the extent possible. And they're using the, trying to use the special permit process to vet that. Um, but that's a, that's a hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to project what all those conflicts are going to be going forward uh, when you put those uses right on top of one another. Um, I, I agree to some extent with, with, with Councillor Cherist uh, in terms of you know, some of the desires of a certain, uh, of, of a generation. I, I do have an issue about, you know, with respect to zoning. That's a planning document for the very long term. And, you know, so planning around a particular trend at a moment in time, I think, is a little, a little dangerous. I mean, I mean it's, it's important to acknowledge trends that are going on. Developers react to that. Um, zoning has to look at the very long haul, and we have to live with the consequences that, uh, of, of the developments that, that happen uh, indefinitely. Uh, so it's not just a single, a single generation issue. Um, and, they, you know, in that particular area, they're not going to be able to, to uh, walk on Route 114 and Route 1 and so forth. So it's a, so it's a little bit of a different uh, dynamic, I think, than, than what might have been described. So at this point in time, um, I'm, I'm not uh, sold on this concept, and that's where I stand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor O'Neill, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll try to be brief, knowing that, and I'm not a member of this um, uh, committee, so I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak. Uh, there's been a lot of good points, and I, I'll try to be brief because a lot of folks have touched on my concerns, and I, I do want to commend the work and effort that's been done. There certainly was a lot of work put into this and thought, um, but at this point in time, I, I can't support it because, you know, I hear lots of comments about we're trying to, you know, attract millennials and, 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 and future um, inhabitants of the city, but, you know, one of our jobs is to protect the quality of life of our current residents, and I think that where we have some of these potential conflicts, as uh, Councillor McGinn mentioned, uh, between potential, you know, um, the current residents with traffic, water quality and demand, which is an issue in many of the neighborhoods. And I think, quite honestly, most of the residents that I speak with and hear from, they feel they're under siege. So creating further development abutting residential areas is not the way I think we want to go. And um, uh, the other aspect is that this proposal or proposed um, uh, ordinance change is going to require the city council to be in charge of this matter through special permit. And, uh, you know, we'll be weighing in on whether, you know, you know, variances for parking, density, setback, height, all types of things that, you know, potentially create further litigation and I just think present 
more conflict than we want with our current residents. They feel under siege. I can't support this um, at the way it's currently addressed. But uh, you know, like I said I just want to weigh in. I, I don't think it's the way to go at this point in time, based on many of the reasons the other councils have raised. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor O'Neill. Councilor Matsoulis, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I, I also am uh, not a part of this committee. And uh, I was really going to wait for Kurt to come back and uh, give us the specific location he was talking about, you know, and I was going to see if it's in my ward, how I feel about it, this and that. But after listening to everybody talk here this evening, um, that's how I was talking 30 years ago. And the message seems to be pretty clear coming out of every council here. Listen, we're against development. That's the message I'm getting here this evening. The people in this city don't want this city being developed. I, I'm not speaking for everyone. I'm just speaking. I'm saying what I'm hearing here this evening. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm not. But we've had enough with development, whether it be commercial, residential, whatever it is, okay? They're looking more to their quality, quality of life right now. Now, I can take you back to the city and explain to you how we got here because I go back to the city over 60 years. I remember when the shopping center was built and, and I, could, I could take on from, from there to where we are right now and how we got to where we are with development in, in this city. Now, uh, one of the councillors says it's a perfect city and, and Councillor Turco said that and I agree. We're very unique in the fact that we have commercial, residential, and industrial. You know, people do go to work right in this neighborhood, right in my neighborhood. People live in the neighborhood, they go to work in the neighborhood. But one of the things they've been complaining about the most is quality of life. And one, in, in, uh, like the counselor said, you know, quality, quality of life is a very important issue. I'm seeing what's going on in Salem and Beverly right now. Salem had the unique uh, um, infrastructure that Peabody had. They had their commercial, residential, and industrial also. And they survived for years and years, and they decided to make a change. And if you want to see that change, take a ride over to Blubber Hollow. There used to be the leather factories over there. They could have turned that into commercial property. Today, the uh, we all know how business is doing great. You can't find an empty spot in my ward. All the buildings in my ward, all the commercial space is rented because that's how strong business is today. And the only ones that are not rented are the ones who are looking for too much rent and they're looking to either turn it into residential because they know there's a lot of money in it. But I want to bring you back to Blubber Hollow now. There could have been an asset to the city of Salem, put their people to work. They've started to put apartments, condos, and they haven't stopped yet. This is just the beginning. You got Salem Suede that's got a couple hundred units going there. You've got, I could tell you their property, yeah, you're looking at a thousand units that are gonna be put over in Salem right now. Go drive over at Blubber Hollow at seven, seven o'clock in the morning and see if the people can even get out of their neighborhood. And where are they going? They're coming to Peabody. Tremont Street is, is uh, from the end of Tremont Street right up to the fire station. There's a line trying to get through Tremont Street. Central Street, it's everywhere, okay? Now, I didn't really want to get into that issue, but only because you all gave your opinion, I'm giving you my opinion too, that um, um, we've got to do some serious thinking about what we're going to do with the future of this city. I think this city is a great city. You know, uh, we have problems like every other city. And, and uh, do we want to develop any more? I'm sure we do. I'm sure we do. Um, and that's why we have people like you, Kurt. And, and I think this council just sent a message to you that, you know, what they're looking for. Um, I don't have the answers, okay? But I do know this. I wanted to give you my feeling, as the rest of the councilors did. I think we're overdeveloped. I don't think that, that uh, bringing uh, more apartments into the city is the answer to the city. I don't think that's what the people in the city want. But, I mean, I could be wrong. 
throw your, throw your plan before us and we'll all take a good look at it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Gravel, please. Thank you, Ms. Councillor Matsoulis. Councillor Gravel, please. Thank you. I, I think that there's some confusion here because of the way some of the stuff is being presented. It's being presented like if you approve this, it goes in all BR, all BR1, all commercial across the board. My understanding of the concept of an overlay is a specific point in the map. It just gives you the allowance in a specific point in the map in a district that's labeled in that, in that area to be able to overlay this and, and allow for development that wouldn't be allowed by special permit or by right within there. And what we're all lacking is what's on the map. And, and I just want to make one other point clear because I was on the council that looked at the map. And uh, I think for 22 meetings I heard the map, the map, the map, the map, the map. And when we came to the 23rd meeting and I said, okay, let's start talking about the map. One meeting, one set of changes, and the map was as the map was with maybe five or six changes made to it because they were worn out. Nobody even wanted to focus on the map. And I think the, the result of that, honestly, from my perspective, was that we didn't give enough attention to the map, particularly where the map borders district to district. So where the BRs, the BR1s and the Rs touch each other, or the, and, and in particular, where the ILs touch the other districts. It was, it was like, you know, we didn't think of using a tool like this to say what would be, and I, and I liked your, your, your concept of a co-mingle. Is there a place for a co-mingle where a, where a better use would be something other than IL? And uh, I, I, unlike my friend, Councillor uh, Mitsoulis, I don't bemoan the day that the, the, the factories, I lived next to the factories, I don't bemoan the day they left. I don't miss the smell. I don't miss the flies. I love the fact, and I'm proud of the fact that I was a Tana, brought up as a Tana. But to be honest with you, the pollution and everything else that was caused by that, we're living the ramifications of that now. So, yeah, we could have left them as factories and such, but I'm glad they decided to make changes and they added some residential. And the farms were dying. So I'm glad they put houses out there. It's a part of a natural growth of a city. But I think for all of us, it would be easier, rather than say, I agree with the concept or I don't agree with the concept, if we knew where you want to apply the concept and what specific part of the map, I think it would be easier for us to understand whether or not we should agree or disagree with the concept. Councilor Turco, please. Thank you. Councillor Turco, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so, I mean, I agree with Councillor Gravel that there, there may be some confusion. So this doesn't, it reads as an overlay district and first line says to allow for multifamily dwellings in the BR, BR1, and MH. So uh, I'll ask directly to Kurt Bellavance, is your overlay district encompassing all three of those districts completely? Because it doesn't specify specific areas of those three districts. And the way it reads to me is anything that's marked that way is encompasses the overlay. Um, is that what your intention is? Yes, correct. So the, the overlay would be BR, BR1, and mobile home. And those are specifically, all of those districts are along either Route 1, uh, parts of 114, and um, Prospect Street. That's where, that's where this is, that those are the locations. They all abut those roadways. Okay, I'm glad, I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page, that that, that, that was a, that's a pretty large district. Yeah, then I, I understand totally what they're thinking of, because from my perspective, an overlay is a tool to be used in a specific area in the map, not a swath across the city. Because as a swath across the city, then it basically says it's fair game for anybody in any location, and that's, I, I don't think that, that concept sells at all, as far as I'm concerned. The specific area in general were the corridors, the Route 1 corridor and 114 corridor. So that's what it was kind of referring to. 
Thank you. And I just wanted to also mention uh, to Councillor um, uh, Rosignol, I forgot his name, uh, to, to Councillor Rosignol's uh, point, there is, no, there is no public transportation on Route 1. This isn't, we, we, we don't have Boston. This isn't it. So I, we keep trying to create Boston. It's, it's not here. And, and there's so many things that we need to do before we get to that point. And we will get there. I'm confident in that. And, and like I said at the beginning, Kurt, I'm not uh, totally against housing. Uh, I've just, I just feel like there's so many things that we need to address prior to that. And to Councilor McGinn's point, we just had, uh, maybe Councilor Sassler can remind me, the, uh, the pork place on Route 1, uh, uh, pigs, uh, the big pig barbecue. We just had to have a uh, cookout on Route 1 because we have residences directly next door to the big pig that were, you know, didn't like the fact that there was a smell going into those apartment buildings. That's what we're going to deal with every day with this, these adjoining districts, with having, uh, you know, commercial directly next door to apartments. And each time we, we receive a special permit, we, you know, we'll have a cookout. So, you know, it's just a, a, another thing to think of. But thank you. Councillor Turco. Councillor Sasla, please. Thank, thank you. I'm not on the committee, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, before I get a little bit of opinion, I, I just had a couple of questions of Kurt, just so I make sure I understood um, what's being proposed. Um, you said that it, it was designed for new structures, but can old structures be knocked down and then rebuilt? Yes. Yep. And could there be an opportunity where uh, lots can be combined and then those would be developed also if the same person bought two pieces of property that abutted each other? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, and um, in the document itself, I did go through it. Was there something regarding how many spaces per unit, or did you, did you leave that open? I saw percentages and things like that. I didn't see anything. I saw the two bedrooms, which you alluded to. Was there anything regarding the number of parking spaces per units, whatever, they may, whatever the proposed development might, might be? Yes, it ranged from a minimum of 1.25 to one and a half spaces, depending on the development. Where is that, just, just so I can see that? It's under the, uh, the dimensional table. It's the second to the last uh, row. Okay, I do see it, thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, one of the things, you know, I, I, I did take the time and, and I appreciate what people talk about the map. Obviously being Wood 5 and Route 1 being thrown, thrown about, is being affected area, I did take uh, the opportunity to meet with Kurt and to sit down and to look at a map, because that was the first thing. Um, and we identified the undeveloped lots uh, that uh, would fall under this, and um, also understanding that there are developed lots that potentially could become uh, potential for uh, purchase and come before us to build it. The lots that were undeveloped um, were, were few. I think we identified five. I mean, one of them actually uh, is the, uh, the uh, show Baseball Academy, so I think we're down to four. Um, and looking at it, you know, I do agree that the concept of Linfield Marketplace um, and commercial and retail um, is not really what's happening on Route 1 if we approve this. I think it's mainly going to be apartment complexes. Um, with limited commercial, if any at all, from what I've been seeing and I've been, the phone calls I get that wants to go on with one. But that being said, I do look at what happened in Chelsea. Um, and there's a need for the millennials, of, they're being pushed out of the city because of the rates, because of the rents. Um, and maybe uh, they want more than a studio. They want maybe a one or a two bedroom. Um, I wish it was more along the lines, and, and we did have some development, like a Linfield Marketplace, all what's going up at the, at the Hilltop site, which is commercial with retail. Um, but I'm not under the illusion that really Route 1 would, 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 that would happen. Um, but looking at the area and seeing what's going on, and, and I, I have uh, publicly have stated that I'm more concerned about water pressure uh, as much as my colleague here in Ward 4, my colleague in Ward 1, uh, where I live personally. It's been an issue, and I've, I've lived in my home since 1996, and uh, it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. I, I, what I'd like to see, possibly, is um, you know, a timeline of the projects that are in the pipeline, along with the same timeline of the proposed water improvements, because I think once you see that, you might feel a little bit uh, 
better, I, th I think the term was used, maybe if you feather in the residential along with the uh, infrastructures to the water improvements, you might get a better feeling for how it's going to affect uh, the people in the city. Um, you know, when it comes to quality of life in, in Route 1, um, the other issue that's a major concern of mine, and I don't know how it's addressed, um, but uh, if you look at the uh, Latitudes Gym, you know, in reality, when you pull out onto Route 1, the Latitudes Gym, there's basically three lanes and a deceleration acceleration lane. It's pretty safe. Matter of fact, you can get right up to Pine Street and pretty much stay in the right-hand lane. My concern is when you go further up Route 1 and you get into the Honeydew Donuts, Dunkin' Donuts, I drive it every day to work, it's tough enough for those people getting their takeout on Honeydew Donuts uh, and Dunkin' Donuts to get on Route 1. So I, I'm a, I have some major concerns about that and putting, uh, you know, there's an undeveloped piece of property, the Marchese Project, pulling, putting anything of major significance, you know, over 100 units, you know, that's just going to create a nightmare. Um, even when you pull out of um, the Gulf gas station uh, onto, onto uh, Winona, it's, 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 it's a dangerous situation that we have now. I actually had someone call me and talk about, you know, is there any way to take some of the land eminent domain in front of the, um, the ultimate dress shop or the Honeydew Donuts to, to, create, to create some type of a lane. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I thought thir for, further, you know, just before the beginning of the summer, I knew Dearborn was coming on. Um, I do believe, by the way, I might be incorrect, I do hope that, I believe there is going to be some off-site mitigation negotiated for that. I believe that was brought up that there hasn't been. I, I believe it's still in the works. I, I hope it is for sure. But when you look at Dearborn area, those 180 apartments, and then you look at Sonic, you know, I, I, I know that uh, people use it as a cut-through are going to hate to hear it, but, you know, at what point do we finally go to the state and say, Maybe we need to look at this jug handle. And I know there's, inf I know there's impact further down at Lowell Street. I get it. But, um, you know, being, uh, you, know, you know, A, a good neighbor to the people north of us, and B, the people who live in this city coming, out of Pe coming up to Peabody trying to come home, how would you like to sit in traffic going all the way back to the Vest Cinemas, if not further to the bridge? So, you know, I look at these things, and I'm concerned a little bit about uh, what's in the pipeline and the impact um, going further. Um, I, I don't feel that what's on Route 1, and I'll talk about that because it's specific to my ward, um, would have uh, major impacts um, other than the water, which is important to me, and I would never improve anything without knowing what the schedule is for when they, we're going to improve the uh, pressure and the booster pump in uh, the Brooksby Farm area, which also has a street of Ward 5. Uh, so I have my concerns, but I did look at what can go in those undeveloped passes of land like uh, Council Gravel talked about. You know, we're trying to just take those final pieces and maybe, you know, the, the puzzle. So um, I have some concerns. Um, I lean towards supporting the project because I also believe um, with the special permit process, it allows us to then judge them individually and for lack of a better uh, example, a, a, another bite at the apple. And, you know, I'm willing to take that risk as far as, when I say the risk, you know, if, if the council doesn't see it fit, you know, the council doesn't see it fit. And, and, and I, I know I would take that personal, but I, I do look at a couple of parcels of land that I've been approached about uh, and I've thought about. But that being said, I still have some concerns extremely with the acceleration, deceleration lane and the infrastructure of our, of our water and the pressure, it's, uh, pressure issues. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Saslot. Do you have something more you want to add, Councilor Sharis? Okay. Thank you. I, I just wanted to be clear. Um, I'm not looking to say, listen, we need to develop large residential units. That's not what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about the opportunity for a business person who's opening up a, say, a restaurant and wants to have, a, you know, six, eight apartments above the restaurant, even maybe a lot of restaurant people who own their property actually live above them and they're looking to do that. These people, so I'm not looking to maximize the amount of apartments we can get on uh, a space when I'm talking about personally. And again, where these places are is that the opportunity for that mixed use and the desire to be bringing in good developers in because they have the opportunity to do it. 
And so, so I just want to be clear, I'm not looking to say we're going to have a commercial area, we're going to put 200 apartments. That's not what I think the goal was in the way I look at it. Thank you. All right. Councilor Turco, please. I'm sorry, this is, since Councilor Chura spoke, I, I, I just needed a, one more point of uh, clarification because I, I also don't think that that's what is written here either. This isn't a mixed-use proposal. This is, this is just apartment buildings. I, I don't see a mixed-use involved with this proposal at all. That, we did hear that two years ago and we voted that down uh, for a mixed-use, but this doesn't say mixed-use at all. This says residential um, only. So I, I think I, I, I'm more likely to support your thoughts with, you know, maybe a little bit of a mixed use on Route 1 where you have commercial and residential. Um, still some things we need to work out prior to full support for that, but I don't think that that's what we're talking about. And maybe uh, Mr. Bellavance can clarify that one. No, it doesn't, it doesn't specifically call for a mixed use structure itself. We would have the uh, commercial and residential in one building. It does allow or at least uh, promote having it on the same lot. So part of that is to include two different um, structures uh, on the same lot. So if you, for example, if you're going down Route 1 uh, where the dinosaur is, you'll see the uh, apartment building, but behind that is a commercial building. So that, and, and talking about trends, that it's, the trend is to go away from the actual uh, mixed-use structure itself and create a lot which would have commercial on the property as well as residential on the property, which I think where the uh, hilltop is, that's what they're doing there as well. So that's what this is more uh, aimed towards versus one structure. Thank you. If I, oh, Councilor Manning Martin, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very briefly, um, I think the discussion this evening was certainly very healthy and um, asked a lot of good questions and brought up a lot of valid concerns. Um, my, just a quick point is that if at any point this were to pass and, and matters come before the city council via special permit uh, under site and design criteria 6.15.3.1, the purpose, you, you mentioned that a special permit will only be granted when a proponent demonstrates that they met the intention of this ordinance, but I didn't see any intention of this ordinance described or laid out and I think that a lot of the questions that the counselors have, um, that needs to be answered because if we are going to be the approving authority by special permit, we need to meet the, we, we meet to make sure that the petitioner meets the intent of, of this ordinance that you're asking to put forward and I just don't think it's clear. So if we are to be in that position, we need to know the intent of this ordinance that you're putting forward and it's not, it's not clear. Thank you. Thank you, if I may, Councillor, I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Bellavance, I, I think you can read the tea leaves. Um, there's been a lot of good feedback. If you want to take another bite at the apple and clean it, clean it up and take away some areas that you've seen through the discussion tonight that uh, you don't really have the will, the Council doesn't have the will to do that, but I'd like to ask the council what the will of the subcommittee is. Do we want to keep it in committee and have Mr. Bellavance uh, take what we've discussed and, and see if he can come up with a better plan for us? Or do we want to take a vote on it and um, take the vote as it, as it way? Councilor Turco, what's your will? From my own perspective, I say we have it in front of us. Let's vote on it as is. If something different comes down the pipeline, then we'll vote on that separately. But this is in front of us now. Um, so I think we need to make a decision on what we have here in front of us. Is there anything that prevents us from coming back again? Is there any time limit? City Clerk, Tim? Can Mr. Bellavance come back with another overlay, a different, different type of overlay that... If it's a, <clears throat> if it's a different proposal, if it's, sub, if it's sub, substantially different, if not, you have to wait till the, till the next calendar year. You heard the will of Councilor Turco. Um, anybody else like to comment before we move forward? Councilor McGinn, please. I would agree with Councilor Turco's approach. So that being said, roll call, please. Uh, excuse me, you need a motion, I'm sorry. Need a motion, Councilor Turco, would you please make that motion? 
Uh, Motion I'll it, to? Uh, I'll, I'll word it and move to approve uh, the zoning ordinance presented by uh, community development uh, for changes in the uh, BR, BR1 and the mobile home. Uh, Councilor Turco, I'm sorry. Uh, Clerk has some advice. I don't think you can make that motion, Council, because we haven't gone through the zoning process. I think your only motion is to send it off to the planning board to start the zoning process. So, Tim, if we send it to the planning board, does it come back to us for but another? Just point of order. I, I think he can make a motion, but uh, it, can't the motion that he makes is to, because all he's doing is, it's, this is a subcommittee, he's recommending something to the council as a whole, not necessarily uh, to anybody else. I mean, the report of subcommittee comes out, and it could be that the, his motion could be that um, to not accept the, uh, the plan as provided, and then ultimately, that's the report from the committee, then the city, then the council as a whole has to vote on it, and if they don't accept it, then you're back at the drawing board. Councilor Turco, Mr. we had. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Councilor again. Just a, a point of order. So I think the confu uh, or the um, disconnect on or the guidance we're getting from the clerk versus Councilor Gravel is uh, since this is a zoning uh, proposal, sometimes there is this belief that we are obligated to send it to the planning board within some uh, certain time frame, uh, 14 days, I believe. But that only pertains, under, under uh, 40A, that only pertains to uh, proposals that come to us from entities that have standing to make those requests. And in this case, um, with, with all due respect to, the, to our planning department, they don't have uh, standing under 40A that would obligate us to send it to the planning board. So, we, I don't believe we need to make that motion. I agree with Councilor Gravel, and I think that Councilor Turco's motion is, is proper under these circumstances. Councilor Turco, did you finish that motion before I interrupted you? you did. Tim thinks you did. Okay, well, oh, I'm sorry. You move didn't... to approve uh, the, the uh, recommended zoning changes from community development uh, with regards to housing in the BR, BR1, and mobile home districts. Uh, so an affirmative, uh, I mean, a, a, a no vote would be as is to, to vote it down. But move, move to approve. A motion by Councilor Turco, roll call, please. Any comments? There being none, roll call, please. Councilors McGinn. No. Rosignal. No. Turco. No. Melville. No. Gould. Yes. Motion fails four to one. Thank you, Mr. Bellavance. We are on to item G, key, adding kiosks for bike rentals, and I believe you have Ms. Davis here to support you. Council, I mean, uh, Mr. Bellavance, please. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Kirk Bellavance, Community Development Director. So the, uh, uh, there was a motion made um, by the City Council uh, back in the spring in regards to um, adding uh, kiosks, bike rentals uh, to the city. Uh, we did, um, uh, working with uh, Jen Davis and, and, and Drew Levin in my office, uh, we did uh, work with several uh, did discuss with several vendors in regards to uh, what approach we wanted to do. Uh, we talked about uh, dockless bikes. We talked about uh, having a dock system. Uh, we talked with other communities, uh, what Beverly, Salem was doing, what they were doing in uh, cities like Revere, Cambridge, and so forth. Um, the first approach was um, maybe the dockless bikes would be the best approach, but then we, we, we soon found out that communities were having trouble with bikes all over the place, left left on sidewalks, crosswalks, things like that, and it, it was becoming an issue. Uh, so then we uh, started to take a look at the uh, dock systems uh, and, and had conversations with Salem um, and trying to work with them. Uh, currently they have Zagster, uh, if you're familiar with that. Um, uh, they use that. Um, part of the information that we did find out, uh, that, uh, that Drew Levin found out, was that um, the city of Salem that has, the, has Zagster, they, they use the app most often, but the second most used city is Peabody. 
So there are Peabody, uh, people in Peabody that go over to Salem, they'll use the bikes uh, as well. And, they, and one of the top traveled routes is basically from Salem to the mall. Uh, so they're, they're traveling to the mall and back again. So it, it was good information that we were able to pull uh, in talking with uh, Zaxter. Uh, one of the areas they pointed us towards was the Metropolitan Area Planning Council that serves as our, uh, our planning um, regional authority. So we did uh, meet with them, we did talk with them. Um, they did a blanket RFP, uh, which basically they run the RFP process and get these, uh, these uses or these companies on board, and then we can just go to them and use them without having to do the RFP process. Uh, and so we talked to them about that. Um, they were looking to, again, at Docless or whether you use the doc system, um, and then it, we basically turned back to uh, talking to Salem because there seemed to be a good connection with them as well. Um, so we're actually, uh, we're meeting um, again next week to talk about that is to try to get together a proposal uh, that we could use um, and, and for the city of Peabody. So it's, it's ongoing. Um, we've been working on it. It's a lot more information. No one, no one in our office was as familiar with it, so we had to sort of get ourselves educated and, and move forward. Now we feel pretty good about it. We can start uh, attending these meetings and come back to the city council with a concept. Thank you, Mr. Bellavance. Any comments for or, or questions of Mr. Bellavance? Council again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, under suspension of the rules, move to receive item 8V and refer the to motion by Council again. All in favor? Any opposed to vote? Council 8D? V? V is in Victor. V is in Victor. Thank you. So Mr. moved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, through you to the Director Bellavance, um, I am very glad to hear that you have uh, gotten that input about the bikes that are the, uh, the, the that are not on the docking stations. I have been in a number of communities where those things are strewn uh, all over the sidewalks, and people are tripping on them and complaining about them. And um, I've also read that they that some of those. Uh, companies have pulled out of cities because they're finding them thrown in rivers and you know they're becoming just a, a nuisance in a number of places so um, I it's it's I, th I would commend you for doing what you're doing and trying to learn from the from the lessons that are happening in other communities because there are some that are kind of out there on the cutting edge of this and we're, we're going to benefit from all those lessons learned um, the so the Zagster uh, alternative that's that's what's going on in Salem, and that's is that is that is that your primary alternative right now, or is that um, one of potentially many? Uh, Drew Levin has been working with Salem. We've kind of broke this up into um, sort of do a team approach and trying to get information. And Drew has been specifically contacting with uh, Salem. If you want to kind of update that one. Good evening, counselors. Uh, Salem currently is under contract with Zaxter for their bike share system where they have a dock system as well as um, a small amount of dockless bicycles as well. So they have actually both. And what have you learned so far about the dockless alternative? Um, I think it both has its pros and cons. I think, you know, you've mentioned the cons that they can be uh, strewn about. Um, Money-wise, it's uh, it's it is definitely less uh, capital intensive to get that started than a uh, dock system. Um, I believe that working with Salem or working with our communities that are very close to us, we could come up with a pretty solid program. And I think docked would be a great way to start introducing um, a bike share program into the city. Um, I think it would kind of mitigate a lot of the concerns that other communities have if we have a dock system. Thank you, and uh, you know, uh, pardon the pun, but Councilor Turco got the wheels turning on this. So the, um, I think he had identified two or three locations primarily around the bike pass, right? Was this, that was the origin of the concept, as I recall, when you made the original motion. Are you, I'm hoping you're looking at some other locations as well. Um, it's, it sounds like you made mention of that there's a well-beaten path to the mall. Um, so it sounds like that would be, have potential and hoping the downtown would also be considered yes uh, we have looked at the downtown as a possibility um, the North Shore Mall as well um, potentially near the bike path at the North Shore Mall as well um, as another location in that kind of campus area of the North Shore Mall and Leahy area 
I think it'd be very beneficial to have stations there. Um, and then providing the connection to the downtown um, would also be very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Any other questions? I just want to say thank you very much, Drew, but thank you, Kurt. You were very patient with us, and uh, you helped us throughout all of those items. Thank you. Anything else uh, in committee? If there being none, I'll take a motion to adjourn, please. We'll we are adjourned. adjourned. Thank you.